Making your way in the world today takes everything you've got. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Wouldn't you like to get away? Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. Good afternoon, gentlemen. How are we doing? Very good, thank you. How are you, boys? How are you, Nige? Ross? I'm very well. Very well good. done, boys. Right. The, the camera's on half. You can't smile, all right? You're allowed to smile. <laughs> no, not in the mood today. All right. So, yeah, welcome to episode two of Authors, which will be out on uh, Facebook later. And the topic of conversation today is, I just thought because we've had a significant week um, with uh, two books being released, Arthur, a bit lazy, catch up. Um, I thought we'd actually talk about what it feels like um, to, to be published, um, how you feel going through the publishing process. And um, I guess those nerves that uh, come when, you know, something that's so personal to you for such a long time, all of a sudden then actually becomes the, the property of somebody else. Hopefully many other else's. So I thought that's what we talk about today. So let's let's kick off. Let's talk about Dead Legacy by uh, Russ Geraghty. Is it Geraghty? Yes, that's right. Good Irish name. Yes, great Irish name. Uh, published last week on the 30th. Um, I've had a good read. And I do agree with the reviews. Um, fantastic page turner. Um, the descriptive language in it, I think, is really powerful. There's a there's an eeriness to the word choice. Um, and it, it's had that feel of... Like, remember those old 1970s ghost stories around Christmas? It had that sort of feel to it. Um, so, yeah, I devoured it in a in a weekend. Um, absolutely loved it. Absolutely loved it. Can't uh, can't say enough good things about it. And um, Natalie, you know, my fiance, she wants it next. She's she's queuing up for it. But yeah, well, that's, it's, that's, that's brilliant. So thank you. That that you know yourself when you write something. You don't know how it's going to be received. Nobody mm. sets out to write a bad book. Um, but it's funny you picked up on that sort of 70s vibe because that's what, what I was... My, my uh, sort of horror um, background is from the Hammer stuff of the 1970s, you know? Yeah. And uh, I don't think you need to describe every every bloodthirsty event. You just need to hint at it sometimes and uh, let the imagination fill in the bits in between. But uh, I'm chuffed you said that, really. And uh, the check is in the post. No problem. No problem. No, I mean, I'm I'm very much like that. I, mean, I think that's why it hit me sort of. I, I enjoyed it the way I did is because I, I love those Hammer. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Um, they're, they're kind of a go to to me. If I if I want to watch something, and I don't know what to watch, especially the Christopher Lee Dracula series. I love Peter, Peter Cushion. Yeah, I love those. Um, anything that's got um, Ingrid Pitt in it because she's incredibly easy on the eyes. That's right. The Countess Dracula especially and uh, the that's Vampire right. Lovers. You know, but the, 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 there's um, that was such a school of filmmaking because they didn't yeah. have much money to make them. And, that's right. And so the power of suggestion in them um, yeah. really, really gets you much more involved. And, and But it did. It had those... It does. It has that Christmas ghost story feel to it. I mean, it's um, almost a bit Dickens at times, I think, in that Christmas Carol sort of feel. Um, in that it's not, I wouldn't call it out and out horror. No, no, it's more of a chiller. I yeah, think. yeah. But there's certain things in it, in certain pages, and you just kind of, you know, it's like that creeping feeling. It's that. You know the, that face at your back. It's that, and I, so I loved it. I love all that. So, well done. Great. It's fantastic. Yeah, excellent. Right. And, and it, I think it's nice that uh, you, as a poet and a writer, obviously um, 
can say that to Nigel. Um, and I think it does boost you. You, oh, it doesn't make sure. you big headed, but it, it, it gives you something and say, so, well, and, you know, I want to write now, you know, that type of thing. Um, and it's nice to hear that. I haven't read it and I'm not going to read it. Um, <laughs> um, because because my, I like it or because he wrote it? <laughs> well, no, because my name's not on it. You know, uh, so I, I'm not going to read it. Simple as that. Um, end of. Um, and I wish him all the success with it. <laughs> Which I'm sure he will. He will have success with it because, as you say, it's a good book. It is. It is. It's really, really, really strong. Well done, Nate. Well done. Both. Well, thanks. Yeah. Th thanks to you both. And uh, it, it, it does. It, it, it does matter. You know, people's opinions, it, it doesn't matter what anybody says. They say, don't bother reading the one star reviews or the two star reviews. Um, but it, it it does matter. It matters to me because, as I said, nobody sets out to write a bad book. This one was 12 years in the making, really, because I, I wrote it originally as a sort of family drama where uh, we had a, a former coal mine owner lost everything gets the legacy of the cottage out in Dolacothy and it was just about the gold and how we tried to rebuild broken relationships. And it wasn't, it was never what I wanted it to be. Uh, I had a full book there and um, I called it Welsh Gold. And I remember speaking to Ewart Alexander, who was a prolific screenwriter, absolute gent of a man. Uh, I would like to say he was a kind of mentor to me because he used to go up there and sit with him out in the garden after he retired from teaching and uh, he went full time as as a scriptwriter. And um, he said, you can forget the title, he said, you're going to have to drop Welsh gold, he said, because any book with the word Welsh in the title is going to bomb. And I said, you could be joking. And and you was was a proud Welshman. Mm. And he said, I'm telling you now, he said, it's a terrible indictment on the world we live in, he said, but I can assure you the book won't go anywhere unless you drop or change the title. So I wasn't prepared to change the title. I mm. decided to change the book. I I'd, I'd wanted at the outset to write a chiller. Um, as I said, I was always influenced as, as a kid uh, during my teens, uh, loved the hammer. House of Horrors and try saying that when you don't pronounce your H's properly. Um, so I just went back and revisited it and uh, basically wrote it as I wanted to write it. And uh, it uh, it does take about 12 years really to get it into the story shape that I wanted uh, through several rewrites. In fact, dozens of rewrites. So um, for you to say that, that's really made my day. So thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's always interesting to read a novel, you know, because we, we discussed last time, I, I very much doubt I would ever write a novel. But I think because of the nature, especially what Arthur does with poetry and, and when I write poetry, I, I think as a poetry writer, you're much more fixated on language. Yeah. And so word choice to, to, to a poetry writer is very, yeah. very interesting because those words have sounds and feelings and they, you know, they conjure things for us. So and I, I think that's kind of what I was probably struck with a lot actually in the book was the, was the, the word choice and the, 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 the mood creation. I think that's why I went to those ghost stories. There's, there's a mood to those chapters, you know, and they're quite short chapters yeah. going through them, but they, there's a mood to them. It's almost, um, I thought when I started, I thought, well, it's a short chapter. I'll read a chapter. And I read a chapter and well, actually now I'm going to read another one now and another one. And I found myself, and you kind of find yourself on this sort of mood roller coaster a little bit. And I think that's always good in, in, in a book. I mean, that's why, definitely why I, I sort of, you know, I love James Herbert's writings and Stephen King's writings and Anne Rice and and people like that because they're, they're, they're mood creators like you know Stephen King could spend two pages talking about a bike that's abandoned on on the side of a road yeah you know, I love that about him yeah, uh, yeah but he he does a very similar thing in some of his word choices I would say are almost poetic 
rather than just descriptive. Yeah. And I yeah. think they are two different things. Um, so yeah, so yeah, absolutely straight in the wheelhouse. I think uh, I think it's a credit to you, mate. I think it's a credit to you. So well oh, done. Thanks very much. Well done. Cheers. Cheers. No problem at all. What about you, Mr. Cole? What have you? How do you? Uh, how, <coughs> what, what's it like for you then? The night before when the book is coming out, how do you feel? Do you get nervous, or are you just too damn talented to get nervous? Well, as you know, <laughs> thank you, Ross. <laughs> as you know, I, I I do not read. I I I, I don't read books uh, per se. I'm I'm not a big reader. Uh, I've read books and they're usually crime books or I will read um, a factual book, you know, uh, psychopaths and stuff like that, you know. Um, uh, so I, I'm, not, I'm not an avid reader. I know Nigel's an avid reader, you're an avid reader. But I, so I'm not actually influenced by other authors. So, and, and when I wrote um, An Ethical Conduct, the first book, um, as you know, I, I was never going to write another book. In fact, when I was writing, I didn't even know what I was writing. Mm. I had it in my head, the plots, the characters, because uh, Nigel, I spoke to Nigel, and Nigel said, create these characters. And uh, and it was quite quite easy for me to do that um, because of what I did. So I, I, I found that quite easy. Um, and obviously the plots, because all, all, all a plot is basically is a story. Mm. Um it's 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 a story, and then you 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 expand it, and that's where Nigel came in with with the plots. Um, you know, I I chucked a thousand word chapter to him. He reads it and he expands it to like fourteen fifteen hundred words, um, and it's quite a I short. I think you book. find there's more than that involved in it. Well, yeah. Words. Huh? In in a chapter. Anyway, uh, two thousand. Say call it two thousand and make it equal. Yeah, that's more like it. Yeah, so, so when I finished it, I think it was about thirty-five thousand words, right? It didn't take me long, and it took me about ten days. And um, Nigel put it all back, to, put it together, and I met him in Puthcar. Um We had a cup of coffee, and he gave me the book, An Ethical Conduct. And uh, he said, uh, and Nigel said, uh, well, because he's written before, he said, well, I like this. I said, oh, there we are, but you know, happy days, like, isn't it? <clears throat> and then we decided to write with each other. Mm. And uh, it just it just progressed from there. But when Nigel said, well, I'll publish it for you, obviously the first thing I said to him is, you ain't having no money off me, but Because I thought he's like on, on the pole, like, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So he said, he said no, I got, I, I, got the, um, I got the account with Amazon. We put it on Amazon. Uh, and we did. And when you see then, um, uh, you got your book, Physically got it and he signs it for me, you know, lovely. And I got, and I bring it home, and I say to Carlin, look, there's my book, like. And then when you go on Amazon, you actually see it on there mm. with your name, um, uh, the price, etc., etc. And then you get a few reviews on there, um, and people like it. It, it, it. You, you're like a, you're like a pigeon. Your chest comes out, you know, and you think, oh, you know, this can't be bad, like, you know what I mean? And I think that's what it does. To um, to an author. Now, I, I akin myself initially, like two years ago, to a to a plasterer. You, you chuck it on, and then Nigel smooths it off. You understand me? <laughs> and, vice, and vice versa with with what Nigel sends me as well. You know, I look at it and and we adjust it all together and we and we agree on it all. And I mm. think that's that's. Um, that that's another thing when you're writing, you know, especially two of you, you you've got to have a balance, and we've never had a crossword with anything. If it if it doesn't, if something that I write doesn't fit, you tell me, and if something he writes doesn't fit, I'll tell him, and we just put it on the back burner or whatever, and use it again. Um, yeah, there are, there are no egos <laughs> in the uh, in the relationship, really. No, no. Um, ne neither of us think that uh, we we the best thing since since sliced bread. We know we've got a lot to learn. And we both more than willing to take advice and to to listen to what the other says. And uh, as I said before, there's no one better for the plots because Arthur's depth and knowledge of police work is second to none. Mm. Uh, there, there, there isn't anything he hasn't dealt with. So for me, as as a writer, uh, when somebody throws you a thousand words of 
a crime, something that's happened, uh, then it becomes really simple to do that pictorial uh, elaboration, you know, to to put the smells, to put the sounds, to put the dialogue. Um, sometimes Arthur does most of the dialogue there, but um, if I don't think the dialogue fits the character, then I'll change it. And Arthur has never, ever queried that. He's, no. he's always left it go, and I've done the same with him. So it, it works in that way. We both trust each other to know what we're doing. Ooh. And you so go back. You go back to Nigel's book now. This new book he's written uh, under a pseudonym of Rascality. That's immaterial to me. If 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 that book takes off uh, and sort of sells in the millions, that's I'm immaterial to me. I, I I'm very proud of him that that it happens because I know he's been chasing his dream for twelve, fourteen years. Me, two years. <laughs> so there's a different sort of. Um, Outlook on things, and I think it's a, when two people are writing, cry, don't cry. <laughs> so when when two people are writing together, I think it's a, like a yin and yang. Do you understand me? Yeah. Uh, and, and it works for us um, because initially we were prolific writing. You know, the books would be being churned out like we we churn in a book out like in five six weeks. Like you know, it was absolutely ridiculous. Crafting, I think the word is Arthur, not churning. Is churning, crafting. <laughs> crafting. I've learned a lot. I've learned my. I, I, Nigel told me I sent him a lot, and, and uh, the last book I think it was Raven. And Nigel actually said to me, "You were writing has improved sort of immensely because when I started, I was like, like I said, I was like a plasterer. You know, chuck it on, chuck it on, chuck it on, just coming out, chuck it on. You know what I mean? But I, I think a little bit more now when I'm writing the chapter." And, and I, I probably got into Nigel's psych of where perhaps he'd take it. Mm. Um, um, so when I write the chapter, like the, the like say the thousand twelve hundred words, I, I I read it, I write it, I read it, and I I, I, I got to be my, what will Nigel think of that now? What will Nigel sort of conjure out of that? And he does it every time, you know what I mean? And um, like I said, we've we've never had a crossword or anything. We just we just enjoy writing, simple as that. But it is it. If anybody sort of is thinking of writing a book, you know what I mean, um, crack on with it, you know what I mean? If you'd said to me, uh, I was 66, I think, when I wrote that book, 67, um, you know, if you'd said to me, like, you, you, you'll have a book out, your own book, I just thought, uh, you know what I mean, pigs will fly, like, but, mm. but it, it's happened. So, it, and, and with the poet, the poet is the same, the poet is a little bit different, you know, I'm doing country singers at the minute. It just yeah. came into my head in the week. I think it was Monday or right, and I I've done like six six country singers, and I just put them on the country sites, you know, the 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 the, the Facebook sites, and people love them, like you know, they because they can relate to what you've written mm. about the individual. As you know, our poet is totally different. You know, you you know what I mean, but like Collodin, you know, if you read your Collodin and read mine, they do jigsaw together, don't they? You know, I mean, and, and that's the way poetry is. But um, most certainly, um, it is nice to be published. But you get hiccups along the way, like you normally do. It's as simple as that. And um, and the publishing world, uh, I akin it to uh, an Esther Vipers, which is which is one of our which is one of our books actually, and it's a brilliant book. <laughs> <laughs> Threw that one in well. No, so the, the, the problem with the. Uh, the publishing world is that um, there, there, there seems to be uh, it. Do I do I resent it? You know, maybe it, it's one of these things now where they pump loads and loads of money into advances for celebrities to write their memoirs or to write a children's book, or and, and there's very little left over for the rest of the aspiring writers. Yeah. Um, it's not about money all all the time. It'd be nice to earn enough money to be able to do it full time. Mm. That's about as far as I would want to take it. It'd be great if anything uh, other than that happened. If if it went on further, that'd be fantastic. But traditional publishing is so wrapped up in these enormous royalties for celebrities because they believe that the celebrity name will sell the book. And the proof of the pudding is in the reading at the end of the day. And majority of celebrities have ghostwriters to write the books for them anyway yeah and it just seems to be 
an absolutely completely bonkers world you know mm. uh, self publishing there is some self publishing uh, writers who are making millions at the moment absolute fortunes from publishing their own books that's the postman that's the postman and that's my blind dog welcome welcome in him <laughs> as he delivers the letter through the letter box but it's it's just one of those um, crazy situations and um, i think all you can do really is to write because you want to write yeah and uh, and try and improve to make the product as good as you can because it is a product at the end of the day as well it's an yeah. entertainment product so let me throw it back to you then ross how did you feel last week when you released your poetry book um i i tend to go through a whole cycle of emotions really um so <clears throat> because I, th I think it goes down to my comfort with the idea of a book launch um i, I find them a very odd experience and to do one virtually like i did this time was even weirder um because the book had been written and been there a long time and especially the way that I write poetry, a lot of the stuff is about thought processes and feelings and and things like that. So w when you finish writing a book like Beacons, where I probably finished it late last year, mm -hmm. I, I tend to like park that thought process then because I've said what I wanted to say about it. So the book then goes off to the publisher and then you wait on them. So, so then I, I start writing something else usually because I go, well, I, I want to keep writing. I have new ideas. So I've been writing other things. So then and I think but I think to, to sell the book, especially something like like Beacons, which is a very contained um, philosophy of, of free will, which is what the book is about. It's a cracking book as well. A really Thanks. Good read. Thanks. It's um, it's hard to do then do a book launch because the book launch then is two things that I'm not comfortable with. The first thing is I'm not in the mental space of that book anymore. And the second thing is I don't really like reading my own poetry. I'm, I'm not, I just don't like it. So, so all that sort of comes up. But I, I think the only good thing about the book launch for me is it actually detracts from the, from the nerves about the book coming up. Cause I, I, the, I wrote in one of my earlier books actually about how you know there's almost that feeling that it's a child and you've kind of nursed it and you've sculpted it and you've shaped it and to, to a degree you educate a book uh, as an author I think um, and when you do that you become very attached to it um, so for for initially at least I think I was maybe jealous that other people were then going to have it in, in, in an odd kind of way. Um, I mean, there's always that fear of, of, of the critic um, to a certain extent. Um, yeah. You know, I, I tend to hide. I don't really, if somebody likes it and, or dislikes it, it that, I'd have to be honest, that doesn't really bother me much at all. Um, um, it probably should, but it doesn't. Um, so but yeah so there's a there's, there's a weird it's almost like a, a separation anxiety from it and i find like before the book launch like i did last week i sat in here for an hour and i read the book mm. and then sometimes i pleasantly surprise myself which is why i did the the poem um, the marston house as the opener because again going back to the horror connection and you know one of my favorite stories by stephen king um, and I kind of came across that poem again and I was like, oh yeah. And I kind of, that poem made me feel the way I wanted readers to feel when they read it. Yeah. So that, that then gives me that confidence of, well, actually, yeah, some of this stuff is hitting the notes I wanted to hit. Yeah. Um, but no, normally it's a sleepless night. It's, um, um, you know, a, 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 a few bottles of beer. Um, it's, it's a number of things, but I don't think that will ever change. And I think that's because there's because there's such an attachment to it as a document. Um, because I, I like I like to approach it from the the sports mentality that 
well, I finished writing a book, and it was definitely true with fly tipping and driftwood and now beacons, that, you know, that, that, that sporting phrase, he left it all on the field. Then I, when I finished that book, that book has to feel like emotionally and psychologically, everything that I was feeling has to be in that book. Yeah. And then I can kind of step away from it for a while while it goes off and it's galleyed and all that sort of, all that sort of yeah. stuff it publishes to me. Go and get but, a massage. Yeah. Anything to kind of not think about that. So the book launch then becomes hard yeah. because you dive back into it. Um, yeah. And it's been good, and we, I mean, some people have been very kind about it. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a really good, uh, really, I'm, I've always admired poetry. I've never been able to do it. I've never felt that my vocabulary is strong enough um, or broad enough, maybe. I, I, we all have a, a limited number of words that we use on a regular basis. And I think there was a report out yesterday or the day before saying the average 16-year-old uses 30 words in a day uh, over and over again, re repeated over and over again. Um, but as you grow older and you read more, your voc vocabulary expands. I've just never been able to understand the structure of poetry. And mm. I've never been able to, I think, have the confidence uh, to explore words in a way that paints a picture like you both do. I, I just can't do it. And it's not something I want to learn to try and do either because it's um, I'd rather read it than struggle with trying. I, I, I like I have tried one. I tried one uh, a couple of years ago. I did write a, a poem and I thought that's the last time I'm ever going to do that because it takes a certain type of person to be able to do it. That's for sure. And you, your use of words uh, in beacons, I think it, it, it is very, very uh, colourful. I think it's, uh, it, it expresses your emotions in such a way that uh, I, I, I choked up on a couple of them as well, you know, I, I, because I, I connected with what, what you were writing about. And uh, I think if, if you can write something that affects somebody like, like Chillers, where you send a shiver up someone's spine or you make somebody choke up because uh, they, they get a bit emotional about what you've written. Like mm -hmm. so, some of the stuff Arthur's written with um, the pit disasters and things. And you think about the, 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 the poor people who lost their lives. And if you can connect and create some sort of emotional spark in, in a reader, then surely that's what it's all about. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, it, it is. I mean, I definitely, uh, I, I try not to hide any emotions in, in what I write, um, that can actually be quite taxing. Um, you know, the what I'm writing at the moment, and you know, and which we'll go into a different time. But you know, I'm I'm writing some stuff at the moment, and I'm finding it very emotionally draining to yeah. write because the subject matter yeah. of it is is very personal, and. Um, and so I find myself right in to a point where my emotions build to such a level that I have to stop and step away from it. Um, but also, you know, so my thing is, if I don't write emotionally, then I don't, there's, then there's little point in me doing it. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's, uh, you know, it, it's quite, it goes very much, very much back to sort of my, my childhood where my father, when I was young, my father believed there was two types of music, right? There was Neil Diamond and it was rubbish. Right, that was it. <laughs> and if Neil Diamond didn't write that, it was rubbish. Simple as that. <laughs> um, and I'm a Neil Diamond fan now. Um, I don't know if I'm a genuine Neil Diamond fan or whether I've just been indoctrinated from birth. But my father made me focus on lyrics very, very early. Mm. What, what's, what's the songwriter saying? Don't ignore the tune, listen to the words. Yeah, it's poetry. So, yeah, and my father wrote some lovely poetry. You know, when I was young, he's written some lovely stuff. Um, but so in my in my head, it's kind of like my father almost gave me these shapes and of, the, of these things to work with, you know, which which is which is great. The other side of the of the coin is, of course, you know, is is the Welsh mam, right, who are emotionally supercharged. Um, you know, emotions kind of off the scale. Um, when I when I was on the, 
when I was on the radio in Cardiff and we were talking about writing and I was being asked questions and I, I referred to my mother as a mainly benign tsunami of emotion. That's not bad. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that's really me, that is. Yeah, which I, which I thought, you know, that's a that's a nice nice thing to say, but she she did interpret it as me being nice. Um, so I I, I had a slapping after it. So I think it is. So I think I think that the two parents are kind of represented in in what I do. So there's my yeah. father's love of words, but then there's the emotional mother or ma'am. You know, nobody's more emotional than a Welsh ma'am. Yeah. And so I kind of crash them into each other, and I, I think that's what kind of Spurs me on to do it, but you know, like I said, it, it can be exhausting. It can be exhausting, yeah. and uh... I um I don't find writing poetry exhausting. Um, like I I can close the computer and I will see something on the telly, and I think, oh, I'll write a poem about that. Hmm. And and that, that you know, I mean, when I started writing initially, um, uh, I got friendly with a lady from Rathlin Island called Mary Cecil. Now, her husband Tommy was. The ferryman who used to take, uh, he's a deep sea diver as well. You know, he used to, he used to dive off the uh, off the wrecks off Rathlin, and uh, he, was, he was a superb diver. He died actually in a diving accident, but he was the one who uh, rescued Richard Burton, um, Richard Branson, where, when the balloon went down in the in the Atlantic. Um, so I was talking to him, and I wrote a poem about about Tommy. But prior to that, I I, I researched Rathlin Island, and I thought I write write Mary a poem about Rathlin Island. And I, it didn't take me long, 20 minutes, I wrote this poem about the the seals and the gulls and this type of thing, the the, the, the wrecks, that type of thing, very descriptive, you know, and, and rhyming descriptive. And um, she loved it and she said, my daughter read it and said, how can a man who's never been you write that? Um, as you know, my poetry is more authentic um, is storytelling mine is, mm. uh, but what I try to do, especially with the war and the coal mining, I try to put myself in the position of who I'm writing about. Mm. Uh, the short at dawn uh, poems I've written for, for the short at the short at dawn people. Um, I try to put myself in the position of a young soldier, seventeen, who's being executed for desertion, and he shouldn't have been, and he's writing home to his mother, you know, it's, it's my, you know, that type of thing. Um, so, so my poem is more authentic, um, and like like Nigel says, when you read, let's say, about Abba Van or Park Slip, um, people who read it um, can identify to it. Mm. And it you know what I mean? And, and and I find it quite easy to write a poem. Like I say, I'm doing the I, I did what I got yesterday. I've done Johnny Cash and people like that. And all I do, I research them. I get quote the quotes of people about them, and I just blend it out, put it in a blender, and out it comes. And you just you just do the five verses or whatever. Um, but so I, I don't get the emotion that you've got. Do you, do you understand me, Ross? I, I don't get emotional about anything. What I'm writing, um, obviously, sometimes when I read a few back like Abba Van and stuff like that, I do get a little bit sort of, you know, sort of oh God alive, you know, that type of thing. But I certainly don't get emotional, and, and as you go about reviews, personally, I don't give a monkey's about reviews, to be honest with you. If somebody read, say, an ethical content, give it one star and said, it's a load of crap, happy days, like, that's their opinion. And then you get, then the other day, then you'll get somebody saying, five star, brilliant, page turner, couldn't put it down, happy days. Mm. But So I think as an author, you've got to be a bit resilient as well. Yeah. You, you've got to be, a, you, you've got to be sort of, just because you've written it doesn't mean everybody's going to like it. No. Well, uh, no, that's right. You, you know what I mean? Because um, all people go for now are likes, especially on Facebook, isn't it? Likes, likes, likes. You know, you think because you've got 10 million likes, you think everybody, but they don't. They just press the like button. And, like, you know what I mean? You're yeah. better off. Like, I, I've got a th over 1,000 on my poetry group. If I get 100 likes, I know those people have read it. Mm. You know what I mean? Loads more have read it and liked it. The others have just browsed through it and just don't put nothing on there because, yeah, they've read it, but you know it's immaterial to them. You know what I mean? That type of thing. So, no, I I, I don't get emotional, you, uh, and I certainly don't get emotional with Terry. You know what I mean? Because uh, all that's to do is killing and mayhem and murder. So, 
Yeah, I think that's one of the interesting things, and it's probably more prevalent with poetry than with prose. And, you know, I've had Natalie come to me and, and say, I didn't like that. No. I read that, I didn't like it. And, you know, and I've said to her, good. Well, what makes you think you were meant to like it? That's right. Well, what makes you think that you meant to read that poem and feel comfortable and enjoy reading that poem? Because <clears throat> when I wrote that, that's not how I wanted you to feel. I mean, there's, there's one I wrote about. Uh, it's basically like the interpretation of a bo- of the boogeyman, you know. And and she read it and she said that I didn't read, I didn't like because that scared me. Because of the way I positioned the boogeyman in it, she she found it quite upsetting. Yeah, and I yeah. didn't like that. And I went, well, good. Because <laughs> that means it works. Yeah. Exactly. You know? I, I remember reading about uh, James Herbert mentioning, uh, or, or, or sorry, a critic uh, slating James Herbert for The Fog mm-hmm. and uh, said that they found it very, very difficult to um, to read the chapter because it was it, it is quite a disturbing book actually some of the things that happen there especially in the school etc and it, if you've read the uh, fog and uh, Herbert was really good at uh, creating these um, the, the, these places that you know well it doesn't have to be the one he's writing about but yeah. you know the the old house he's writing about you know the school that he's writing about um, and somebody said they just w- didn't feel comfortable with the story and of course that's the whole point of the story it's not there you, you don't write a chiller or a horror story to make you feel comfortable it's there about it's there to make you feel that discomfort and mm-hmm. then to know after you've finished it that you're actually safe in your house and you can go back to bed and close your eyes uh, eyes and perhaps have a nightmare it's but, fact uh, that's as yeah. It's funny though, isn't it, that that's the difference in that we go to the cinema all we used to. Yeah. Um, to go watch a horror movie to be scared, to be made under yeah, that's right. And we like we and we go, well, we love that film because it terrified me. Or, yeah. you know, and they even in advertising this film will make you sick. It's that scary. And it's weird with film. But yet with with books, we still have that thing of, well, I like that book. And the, the, the two don't seem to kind of gel with each other. You know, it's um, yeah. like when I read The Shining, I think The Shining is terrifying as a yeah. book. It is terrifying to read and it's an uncomfortable read. So is it. It is the same. It's a very unpleasant book to read. Pet Cemetery as well. Yes. The, the thing it yeah. deals with. Mm-hmm. Oh, he's, I mean, you know, the guy is, uh, you know, I, I think he's exceptional. And, and Salem's Lot, I always go, back to that because there's such a a a haunting tone of voice in that book yeah. the, way, the, the way that story is told but also the fact that it's almost being told from the perspective of an author because mm. the central character is an author right yeah. so so that that kind of flips the whole thing on itself um but you know, I, I think that's essential but no i mean it's, especially some of the stuff I, i've written now that hopefully will come out um, next year, you know, it's the, the new, the next book is is not a comfortable book at all, and, and you're not meant to feel comfortable when you read it at all. And um, and <clears throat> again, maybe I've gone a bit into the uh, Arthur Cole psychosis with this one, but it was kind of like I wrote it, and it was very much about well, this is the book that I wanted to write, and if you don't like it, you don't like it. But I, it was almost like I had to write this one. Mm. So that that's quite that's quite you know that's a, that's a weird thing for me to do. You go back to you talk about these people, like, especially Stephen King. You know what I mean uh, I've never read any of Stephen King's uh, books. I've seen the films, obviously, you know that type of but thing. He's read Unethical Conduct. He said it's really. Good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah. But do you think that man is a one-off? The, I, I think the pathology. Uh, of Stephen King, I, I, I think if you could take his brain and sort of uh, analyze it, um, there is some, there is obviously something lacking in the man. <laughs> to, to, no, no, and I mean this, I, I don't mean this sort of uh, nastily. 
but but to write uh, like he does, and mm. they make him into a film, and the films are not far off the books, I've no doubt. You you watch him, you think, Christ alive, is this bloke sane or what to write this? Well, he was, you know, he's, he's quite an interesting character in that his mother was a, a precocious reader. His mother was a massive, she yeah. read, read and read. Yeah. Um, and she would devour books. Um, but he also then, because, and he, and so would he and his brother, they would read a lot of books. Yeah. Um, but also because he was young, he was into comic books and, and movies and, and things like that. So I think, I think he's an example of an imagination that's just un, unbound by anything. Yeah. And she um, encouraged him to write his own comic books as well. And um, and uh, th- there's a great story about, uh, about him um, living rough uh, after they just got married, living in a, effectively uh, a caravan, I believe, mm. and getting the first royalties uh, check through. And I, I think what it is with Stephen King is that he's got such a vivid imagination. He's got such a way with words to capture his imagination on, on the page. Um, I, I, and he's such a nice guy as well, you know. He's a really, really um, thoroughly decent guy. So th- this whole thing about um, that you can't write horror, you can't write chiller unless there's something wrong with you. Um, I think he's the, the complete proof that that's not the case because he is. Uh, he's just a genuinely good laugh. But, if you ever. But didn't I read somewhere the... that uh, he was in a terrible accident, wasn't he? He was. Yes. He bought yeah. the car that knocked him over. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> like you yeah, know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Uh, I think to myself, what's that about? Like, but obviously yeah, yeah. there must be something in his mind going on. Then. I think the yeah. genius of him is. I think it's almost the poet's eye. Mm. Or like. Yeah it was the poet's eye and I, I think it's been able to make something terrifying yeah out of something that's very simple and basic and everyday yeah. um so i mean in my in my opinion like what the greatest one of the greatest horror movies ever made is the original john carpenter's halloween yeah right from 1978 1979 yeah 77 i think is it somewhere along there. might be might yeah. be but yeah. it, it's a masterpiece it's a masterpiece because all of a sudden it wasn't Dracula or Frankenstein or the Wolfman. It was just a guy in a mask on a on a street mm. where people lived, and he, he took that horror and he made it kind of real life. Mm. And I think like with with Stephen King, you know, it, The Shining is terrifying, but ultimately it's about a hotel, mm. you know, and uh, and you know a, 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 a psychic sort of child like Salem's Lot. He takes that the the gothic romance of Dracula. And Frankenstein and all those sorts of books, and he sets it in an everyday town, mm. you know. And and it, you know, I mean, it is is the boogeyman again, right? It is the boogeyman story. Um, but because, misery, but but you, you know, flip misery. that over, then he can write yeah, something like misery, which mm. you, which is a uh, fun obsessed with him. Mm. Uh, and the, the the opening of that book is one of the best I've ever read. I think misery. Yeah. Where, where he's got these pilings, where, where he describes these pilings driven into the into the sea mm. and how the tide comes in to cover them. Yeah. And he's, what he's describing is how the morphine is taking effect uh, because obviously his legs are broken. He's lying in this bed in this place out in the country, out in the sticks somewhere, probably in Maine. Um, and uh, he describes the, the morphine mm. uh, through these palings that are, are, are buried into the um, the foreshore. But that's something a, I, I think it's fantastic. But that's something a poet would do. Yeah, 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 that's right. You know, it's, um, I go back to, I mean, I mentioned Seamus Heaney a lot. And if you ever, ever read his book North, um, which is a book he wrote about the, um, the, the bog bodies they found, you know. In oh, England, yes, yes. Like that. And there's stuff about the Vikings and things like that. And you read that book yeah. and, on face value, we go, right, he's describing these bodies at times. And he's talking about Vikings and stuff like that. But actually, when you look at that book, what he's really talking about is all the troubles in Northern Ireland. Mm. You know, but and so, again, that's why I think especially with King, there's a poet's eye to it. Mm. I think when you take when you have an image like that, or maybe it's me as a, as a writer, maybe I'm being too possessive of it and saying, look, you novelist, you're not allowed to do it. Because otherwise, what are we going to do? <laughs> um, 
but there is that, and I think James Herbert had that as well. I mean, Stephen King yeah. was known as one of the greatest writers of all time. Oh, that was yeah. shot in the dude. He'll be remembered, you know, with people like Shakespeare and, and all these sort of guys, because yeah. his body of work is enormous. Yeah. And it's incredible. I mean, The Stand, again, is, is an amazing book. It's a long book, but it's incredible. Yeah. But what about you, Nigel? What was it like for you on the night before um, Dead Legacy waiting to drop on us? Well, I, I think I distracted myself by uh, absolutely obliterating Facebook. Um, I, I wanted uh, to get it out there to make sure that people knew it was out there. And I think I must have bored people uh, uh, sick with it in the end. But it, it is a worry because you just don't know how a book is going to do, where, how it's going to be received, whether or not uh, it'll hit that basic requirement that you wanted to put in there for me to, to send those chills occasionally. Um, so it, it, it is almost like, um, as, as you said before, it, it, it's about completing the package, sending it out almost like in a little boat down the stream and hope that it reaches the destination that you wanted to get to. But if it stops a couple of times along the way, somebody picks it up, looks at it, puts it back in and sets it on a way on its way again then that's fine even if it doesn't get down right down to the ocean you know and uh, I see the ocean as being my ultimate goal really you know the the wide open sea of of loads of money uh, no, I, I, actually it's, it's it's just getting it read you know it's the exposure of the book if yeah. people don't read it they can't they can't say anything about it. If somebody reads it and tells a friend, I really enjoyed that, you should have a look at that, then that's all right for me. That That's what it's about. Well, I'm, I'm definitely going to pimp this one out, mate. I'm going to pimp it out to anybody I can. Oh, thank you very much. Cheers. Well, I, really well, I, did, I didn't le lose any sleep when that was published the night before. <laughs> so you know me. <laughs> no, you're that's doing well. Fair right? to have supportive yeah. friends as well. Yeah, yeah know, it's like, great. But yeah, no, he's, he's, he's done well with that and um, power to his elbow. Um, now all he's got to start doing now is writing more Terry Maguire, you know what I mean? <laughs> but he's into marketing now, see? So he's, he's yeah, got the yeah. bug for that now, see? Mm -hmm. uh, which, again, as you know, uh, when we started writing, um, we, we, we started doing the libraries and stuff like giving talks here, there and everywhere. But obviously that's dried up because of the COVID. But... I can see when Niger's going with marketing, you know, um, we do a lot on Facebook and um, we, we got the website and everything and we, uh, the Terry Maguire, which will go now with the, um, with the dramatization, you know, as that's progressing, obviously the more stuff will go on the, on the site for that. Karen will put more on there, but um, you, you've got to get it out there. It's like anything. Um, um, you know, I mean, it's it, it's and it, it is difficult. You know, um, so you is, don't get nervous at all. Who now? You. No. You don't get uh, nervous at all. No, the only time I used to get nervous was when I had to go to the Crown Court to give evidence. Right. Um, the, and if you're not nervous you're when you go down there, you mean the policeman, yeah, not the accused. Yeah. Yeah. Not the accused. <laughs> and, and anybody who tells you, any policeman who tells you that he enjoyed going to the Crown Court to give evidence is a liar. Yes, because I'm it's on the that. most daunting place to stand on your own in the box with a judge looking at you, two barristers and a jury and a court full of people. And you've got to tell the truth. Haven't you? Well, you get yeah. caught out. You well, get, that's the hard bit, is it? Telling the truth. You get caught out. So, no, I used to, I used to, it's a good nervousness. Do you understand me? It's, it's, um, if you haven't got that nervousness, um, there's something wrong. Mm. Well, it's, it's, it's right like being top class sport, isn't it? Like, like you were yes, saying. Yes, it's 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 like you you speak to all these top class sports. They've all got their little e eccentricities, haven't they? You know, touching the yeah, thing, the nerds, or yeah. touching this, or wearing this, or wearing that. You know what I mean? And they got a nervous energy. Uh, but I don't get that with writing. Mm. If you understand me, it, it's well, your freedom uh, isn't at stake, is it? You know, uh, um, it, it, your freedom isn't at stake when you're uh, writing, but it is if you're in Crown Court and something yeah, goes wrong. Turning lights. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you should have been locked up for some things you've written. Well, I <laughs> should have been locked up for a few things I've done. <laughs> you, and, and that's where it comes in the books, you know what I mean? Because mm. 
you've got this experience. I can write. If I wanted to write a chapter now about a, a, um, a detective being called in to give evidence, and knowing full well he's been up to nonsense, you know, I, I, I could have him cross-examined and uh, the judge actually saying to him, uh, DC Lane, I think you'd better go to the box, go down to the police room and have five minutes and come back and tell us what happened. And the judge is basically telling him, you, you, you don't know what the ball looks like, so off you go now and come back, I'll give you a second chance. So, you know what I mean? Um, no, I, I don't get nervous. I leave that to Nigel. All, all the nervousness, energy. That's why I've lost my hair. Yeah, that's how he's lost his hair. But, you know what I mean? I, I don't know. And I think the other thing is, because I started writing late, um, I've gone past the point of no return, basically. I've, I've gone past that. I suppose if I started writing in my, my 30s, I'd be a little bit more sort of, ooh, the book is coming up tomorrow. But, mm. but I don't get that. Uh, Nigel will tell me, especially when we're self-publishing, I just say, the, the book is out tomorrow. I, oh, lovely. Uh, it's a little bit different now you've got a publisher because you're in the hands of the publisher. You've yeah. got no control over it. Mm. You've got no control. Whereas when we self-published, we had, Nigel used to do all that. We had more control, didn't we? If yeah. Nigel said to me, uh, we've got to get the next book out now in a couple of months, you just write the book. Yeah. And out it would go onto Amazon and whatever. And um, but we, you, when you're with a publisher, you haven't got that luxury because you're guided, as you know, by the way it's published or when it's going out or whatever. You're mm. given a time frame and you know, all whatever. Um, uh, but with with this publishing, like we said earlier on, I think Nigel hit it on the head. You know, you you got all these famous people writing books, writing like David Walliams. They interviewed him on, on on the telly about one of his books, and he didn't even know it was in it. You, you know, I mean, when they asked, you know, what was what's the content? He uh, he was a bit flummoxed, really. You know, I mean, then he, he he sort of bullshitted his way through it. It's a brand, isn't it? It's a brand, yes. It's a brand, and um, I, I I think there's a lot of false. A lot of falseness about it, and I hate that. Um, you know, when we used to go to the uh, the book fairs, you know what I mean? You've got all these authors there, you know what I mean? A lot of them are very guarded, you know, very guarded indeed. Mm. Um, with word catcher, obviously David likes authors to speak to each other and they help each other, mm. which is what we do. Um, I think that's a bit unique as well. Mm. I think that's a unique thing because I find... I, I, I used to go with Nigel to these book fairs and find them very guarded people, you know, I mean, you get in a bit of a conversation with them and then it sort of peters out, you know, and I think, oh, well, well then, but, you know, you're not really interested in yeah, it. It's like the kid with his arm in exam, right? It's like... Yeah, you yeah, you got it, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you know what I mean, you're not copying off me, like, and, and Nigel will tell you, I've had blow people ring me up who are writing books, especially crime books, and uh, sort of ringing me up and asking me about this, or asking me about that, and I think to myself, well, you're a crime author, you know, you write, are you... Why are you writing about something you don't know about? Mm. Why are you asking somebody now about something when the book you were writing is is a crime book? Well, that kills my next question. What's that? What is that? <laughs> well, I was going to say, I was thinking about writing a crime book, and did you have any advice? For it? <laughs> no, Give I... Give me I, a ring, I, Ross. You, you right. mean, I think... <laughs> Give me a ring, right? You can ask I, me the question, and then I'll ask Arthur without saying where it's come from, get the answer, and then feed it back to you. Yeah, yeah. Well, secrets, you know, secrets. If, if, if you said to me now, look, I'm thinking of writing a cry, I said, right, what, what's 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 the, the skeleton of it? What, 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 where are you going with it? And you'd probably say, oh, it's drugs, it's sex, it's murder, it's this, it's this. and then you give me the plot, and you, you mentioned county lines to me. I said, ooh, hang on a minute now. <laughs> you, you're opening a big can of worms. Mm. And to write about county lines, you've got to know all about it. Because somebody who reads it think, especially police, they go, fucking, that's a load of nonsense. You know what I mean? Christ, it don't happen like that. You know what I mean? But the, I think the next book I'll write, I'll take it back to the 70s. Like Ashes to Ashes. I'll create a character there. Mm. And I, I'll say it as it was, warts and all. Mm. Where you know con your contemporaneous notes were made like three weeks after you interviewed the bloke. Yeah. <laughs> right. Because that's the way it was. You know, yeah. you wouldn't fit in anybody up. 
he was just just telling a story of what he told you, <laughs> basically. And that's the way it was. Yeah. Your, your pocketbooks, you know, supposed to be made up at the time. Well, they weren't. Especially detectives' pocketbooks. They couldn't keep their diaries up to date. They know their pocketbooks, <laughs> you know. It, it, and that's going back, like, in the 60s and the 70s. Totally different today, isn't it? Everything's on tape. You know what I mean? You just press a press button now and away to go. But you, you, they didn't do it then. So, you know, I, I, I suppose if we wrote a book like that, there'd be a pro. But so Jerry Maguire was. is going to time travel. Is that what we're saying? Well, why not? <laughs> why, why not? Why not? You could go in the old I castle. Would. He could go in the old castle one day, have a couple of pints with Raven, fall over at his head, and wake up in 1969. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's been done. <laughs> Be careful now, you're giving stuff away. Yeah, I Right. No, I'm not. I know I'm not. I've got a question for you, gentlemen, and we'll wrap right. this up because you're running out of time. Okay. I saw an interview with Ozzy Osbourne, right? The, uh, the godfather of heavy metal. And they were asking him about the albums that he writes. Right, I'll go to you first, Nigel. And they asked him, is he happy with all the albums and the songs he's released and all this sort of stuff? And he gave a very interesting answer. He said, I'm not happy. He said, because I haven't written my Sergeant Pepper yet. Yeah. So to him, Sergeant Pepper was that standard, right? Which is our yeah, choice, yeah. Of Metalhead. I mentioned earlier North by Seamus Heaney. So mm. if, if I could write something of that caliber, what is, what is your gold standard? What, what is your book that you think, Joe, oh, I wish I'd written that? Yeah, I think um, when it comes to the, the chiller side of things, I was very much influenced by James Herbert as, as a teenager. And I loved Survivor. Uh, I, li I particularly liked it because... Um, at the time, my brother had just gone to Shoreditch College in Egham in Surrey, and the whole thing is set in that area. So I knew the area, or at least I had been to the area, so I could picture where the events were unfolding. And it, it's a really good twist in the end as well. And it's all about the su survivor syndrome, plus some obviously some supernatural stuff thrown in there as well. So from that sort of side of things... I would go for that one, I think, because it, it's always stuck in my mind. I, I, I remembered it uh, all these years. I can still remember the story. From a crime point of view, I think the... I am a fan of Ian Rankin. I do like his stuff. Uh, and I like the way that he's created this character that, that that's um, is almost like a sort of national institution now. Uh, it, it, it's just the way that he writes as well. I think he does it extremely well, you know. And uh, so I think I'd, I'd go for him. I think mm. one of my favorite books of his is The Crow Road. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think that is a, a wonderful yeah. skeletons exactly. in yeah. the closet type type yeah. uh, brilliant book, brilliant book. But yeah, great choices, great choices. Right, the man that doesn't read books. Book-wise, uh, Harry's Game, okay. with Gerald Simo. Mm -hmm. yeah. I read that many, many years ago. Obviously, it's about the, uh, the Troubles in Northern Ireland. I, yeah. I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, Crime-wise, um, I'd have to go perhaps for Patricia Cornwell, Scarpetta, um, the pathologist. I read a couple of her, but you're going back a long time. So crime-wise, those two. Um, well, not so much crime, but Harry's game. It's more the underlying problems mm. in, in Northern Ireland at the time, you know, when he sent over there to infiltrate and that type of thing. And that, and when we did um, Nesta Vipers, you know, you could you can bring that into that part of it, you know. Um, poetry wise, well, it's got to be um, Sassoon and Wilfred Owen. Uh, anything by them, you know, more so Wilfred Owen. Um, because obviously, as you know, he was killed before he came home. Like you know what I mean, and these were sort of men of, these were literary men. These were who people uh, when they joined the the military thought you know the poets like you know what I mean. But they 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 were brave men, and um, yeah. So I, I yeah those Ari's game. Uh, Patricia Conroy read a couple of her books, uh, and then the two poets. They sort of 
I enjoy looking back on 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 the poem hunter and putting Wilfred's name and pulling one out like and you know, reading it. You know what I mean, and I must say they have inspired me in relation to writing about the war. Um, yeah. the, you know, the, the, I've had inspiration from them, um, and you can't copy them. You you can never copy them because they are they are sort of um, language and text, and they were there. They they were there. You know. Uh, uh, and that's what I try to do when I, I write a, a, call, um, a coal mining or a, a, a special First World War poem. Uh, I like to sort of go back there, like, and yeah. uh, get the smell, like you said, the smell, the feelings, the rats, the, you know, the lice, you know, the mud, the trench foot, you know, all these things, you know what I mean? Mm. Um, like I did the, uh, I did a few for the uh, shot at dawn because there's a big memorial every year for them up in... Um, up in the West Midlands, and uh, as you know, two, I think it's over 200, have been actually been pardoned, uh, and I did, uh, I think I did five, five of these soldiers uh, from different areas, which I gave to them, you know, that, you know for, and they've been read out at the memorials, that type of thing. So yeah. I get pleasure from that, you know, um, mm. uh, when when things are read out and stuff like that. You know, but yeah, that's, that's mine. All right, All right gentlemen. Well, we have run out of time, unfortunately. It has been an absolute pleasure talking to one of you. <laughs> I'm both of you. Both of you. I'm, joking. I'm joking. I I'm worn out, Diane. Well, it's all I'm our thinking. Actually worn out. Well, you're a policeman. You're not used to thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. No, thank you very you. much for your time. No um, problems. In great challenge, you both again. Anytime, Ross. And Cheers, uh, Ross. We'll do it again soon. Thank you, boys. Yeah, yeah thanks very much. Yeah. Take care. Cheers, boys. Bye. And you, Nigel, look after your way. Yeah, and you, Ross. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Wouldn't you like to get away? Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name And they're always glad you came You want to be where people can see Your troubles are all the same You want to 